The second reading is from 1 Corinthians 12. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Well, Pentecost was four months ago. <laughs> uh, we just marked the 17th Sunday after Pentecost. And I always wonder, does after mean that something happened long ago but isn't happening now? Do we call this the season of ordinary time because nothing extraordinary happens? <laughs> we heard the Acts reading. Uh, as we set it together antiphonally. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young shall see visions and your elders shall dream dreams, even on my slaves, both men and women. In those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. Peter was sure that those days had arrived. But if the Spirit was poured out on sons and daughters, the daughters barely get a word in edgewise <laughs> in the rest of Acts. What happened to Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women who brought news of resurrection? Well, we remember the disciples thought it was an idle tale. Maybe that suspicion continued into Luke's second volume, the book of Acts. Well, there are some women. There's Sapphira. Some of you remember her. She and her husband Ananias uh, kept proceeds that were meant to be brought to the apostles, and she uh, she said, that she has a line, she said, yes, that was the price, and then she fell dead at the apostles' feet. Tabitha, also known as Dorcas, raised from the dead, but she didn't say a thing. And there was Rhoda, the maid. She went to the door, do you remember? Everybody thought that Peter was in prison, and she went to the door, and she could tell that it was Peter. She got so excited, she didn't even open the door. She ran to tell the others, and they said, you are out of your mind. Thank heavens for Lydia. Yeah. This woman has the longest speech of any woman in the book of Acts. She said to Paul, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay in my home. And he did. So that was it, basically, <laughs> about the women who speak. We hear about Priscilla. But she doesn't say anything either, and uh, Philip seemed to have four unmarried daughters who prophesied, but nobody remembers their names or what they said. So, Peter, um, what happened to the daughters? I'm sure Caroline would want to know. <laughs> and what happened to the slaves? 
both women and men. Nobody wanted to listen to the slaves. They thought Rhoda, the maid, was out of her mind. <laughs> we know this isn't an old story. Our country was built by slaves, but nobody expected them to prophesy. Even after emancipation, nobody expected them to be anything other than servants. Be polite. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Keep your head down. Don't make trouble. Walk on the other side of the street. It's hard to prophesy when your body is threatened with beatings and lynchings. It's hard to prophesy. Since Pentecost Sunday, June 4th, this summer has seen lots of Confederate statues knocked from their pedestals. Some have been jubilant, others have been angry. From New Orleans to Richmond to Charlottesville, those statues have had to come down. The mayor of New Orleans gave a really powerful speech telling us why they were put up and why they needed to come down. He said this, these statues were erected on purpose to send a strong message to all who walked in their shadows about who was still in charge of this city. Just before the Civil War broke out, the Vice President of the Confederacy made it clear that the Confederate cause was indeed about slavery. He said this, The Confederacy's cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery is his natural and normal condition. So Peter, what happened to the slaves, both women and men? I think that that vice president of the Confederacy was probably a Christian. And many people say that this is a Christian nation, or maybe we would rather say it is a nation that has a lot of Christians. Either way you say it, it doesn't seem that we have been formed by the bold promise of Pentecost, that God's Spirit has been poured out on all flesh. Peter's Pentecost sermon is empty without bodies. Of course, Luke didn't know that we are the body of Christ. Well, he hadn't read 1 Corinthians. <laughs> I mean, I don't think so, Caroline. It, I look to Caroline for all things biblical. Uh, I mean, it had been written already by the time Luke wrote Acts, but I don't think that Peter had read it. 1 Corinthians, of course, I mean, this is a lectionary text for Pentecost Sunday, and it's paired with Acts because of the connection with the Spirit. And this is wonderful. We love this text about the gifts of the Spirit. We often expand it to include our congregations. Some teach Sunday school. Some sing in the choir. Some get roped into working with the youth. <laughs> Some work on the stewardship committee, and some speak in tongues. Well, very few Lutherans, actually. <laughs> Paul affirms these gifts by saying that the church is the body of Christ. Listen to how many times he says body. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. 
Then in the same chapter, Paul goes on to talk about feet and hands and eyes and ears, and he summarizes that section by saying, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. The body of Christ. It surprises me, really, that Paul found this metaphor. Because we usually think of Paul, frankly, not being so positive about the body. To the Romans, he wrote, to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, maybe body and flesh are very different for Paul. But it does press the question, is there any flesh on the body of Christ? Is there any flesh on the body of Christ? Pentecost is more than a memory. I dare say it's still going on, even the 17th Sunday after Pentecost. <laughs> And I have heard these two texts talking to one another, not so much about the spirit as about the body and about flesh. From Acts, God says through Joel, through Peter, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And Paul says now, you are the body of Christ. I have a feeling that this metaphor, body of Christ, meant more than even Paul could imagine. Or that he didn't see the fullness of that metaphor in his time. We need to put flesh on the body of Christ. Just touch your hands. I'm talking about flesh, flesh on the body of Christ. It's not about quotas or inclusiveness. It's about incarnation. The body of Christ must have flesh on it. Are the daughters as well as sons part of the body? Is the body of Christ dark skin? Is the body of Christ disabled? Is the body of Christ poor? In this anniversary month of the Reformation, I think it's really a big part of our calling to put the body back into the body of Christ. Bodies, particular bodies, oppressed and resistant. Rosa Parks, refusing to move her black body to the back of the bus so that a white body could sit down there. Disabled bodies, chaining themselves to city buses until finally city buses were able to kneel down and have ramps so that they could get on the bus in a wheelchair or a scooter. Did you see them not long ago, those scooters and wheelchairs jammed into the Senate Finance Committee, <laughs> blocking the door? Nobody knew quite how to get them out of there because nobody really wanted to haul a person in a wheelchair out the door. Bodies, oppressed and resistant, and some of you were probably there when millions brought their bodies and their pussy hats to stand together for women's lives, to say the daughters are part of the body. Native people from tribes near and far holding their bodies against the freezing water of water cannons at Standing Rock. 
and most recently now, African-American football players kneeling down, putting their bodies on the line because they believe the flag is not what we think it is. You know, I'm not really a fan so much of NFL or NASCAR, but I, I just want you to picture something, if you can. Here, on this side, there are NFL football players, you know, taking a knee, like so. You look at them, 90% maybe black bodies, African-American football players. Okay, hold that. Over here, there are NASCAR drivers. Four NASCAR drivers are black out of hundreds. So you can see the NASCAR drivers here. I don't know how many there are, but they're standing for the flag. Now, can you, you've got to see it, the bodies. These are a lot of white bodies, like mine, over here. And then over here, there are a lot of black bodies. Now these bodies have been judged to be unpatriotic, dishonoring the flag. These bodies have been applauded for honoring the flag. Now, trying to look. Could, could it be that the race, the flesh of these bodies over here are never expected to respect the flag? And these bodies here are seen as honoring the flag and being respectful. I don't know. But the picture is pretty telling. I have found it very hard to preach in the season of Pentecost. It's not Pentecost per se, it's the time in our country, the summer perhaps, the things that are happening, that sometimes I feel like any time I'm invited to preach someplace or any time I'm at Grace University where I am a member, that every, no matter what the text is, the text is always about race. And it's so very hard. It's so very hard, and I would imagine that some of you are finding it very hard, too. Caroline quoted Benet Brown today that it's not really worse, it's just that we are uncovering what had been hidden. And I think we have uncovered a strain of racism in our country that has shaped the ELCA, that shapes my life. I live by the University of Minnesota, Kaufman Memorial Union, named for one of the presidents. I just read in the paper that he refused to let black students live in the student dormitories. And he said, the races have never lived together, nor have they ever sought to live together. He kept black students out of those dormitories until his death in 1938. It's hard to preach about race. Hard in our congregations, which my guess is that if it's like the congregations I've been part of, been pastor of, are mainly white. We have the distinction, you know, of being 
the whitest denomination in the United States. The Pentecost season is long. I hope it's long enough for us to put flesh on the body of Christ. It is hard to preach about race and racism and the privilege that I have as a white person. It's hard, but it's unfaithful to never preach about race in this country. Many of us, I think, love Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech because it talks about how we're all going to be together. <coughs> little black girls and little black boys joining hands with little white girls and white boys on the red hills of Georgia. But Dr. King ended that section of his dream speech not with his own agenda, not with his own upbringing, not with any kind of sociological analysis. He ended it with the book of Isaiah. I have a dream that every valley will be exalted and every mountain and hill be made low and the crooked places will be made straight and the rough places will be made plain and the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. All flesh. Oh, he hopes we can put flesh on the body of Christ. Pentecost isn't over. Let me answer, for, uh, let me just say first of all the, the question that was asked of Caroline, um, how did you come up with this text? And uh, Justin would be able to tell you that I gave him this text very recently, <laughs> more recently than two weeks. Um, I'm not in a congregation either uh, as Caroline. I get, I, I get to preach uh, in various places, mostly to strangers. Uh, but often in my home congregation, Grace University. But I did not uh, get to preach on Pentecost Sunday. But I did preach this, a form of this sermon um, later that day at a conference at Augsburg College. So I had begun to play with this text a bit. Uh, at that, that was an event called Embodied Justice and it was sponsored by the ELCA uh, women's desk, so it was much more focused on the daughters. And it was much more focused on um, things that had happened in the ELCA that had um, not been happy news for women. So it was a different kind of sermon, and I didn't, I didn't, what I didn't hear at the time that really changed for me with this sermon was, I know that these texts are put together for Pentecost because of the Spirit connection. Uh, the varieties of gifts of the Spirit and then the Holy Spirit being poured out on uh, Pentecost Sunday. Uh, what I ha hadn't heard before was how these texts might converse with one another about the body and flesh on the body, uh, where that begins, uh, the part that we sort of sometimes sort of miss it in the text is uh, in those days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. We get to your sons and your daughters will prophesy pretty quickly and we sometimes don't hear that. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, which sounds different from saying I will pour out my spirit on all people. Now, I don't think it's helpful to do a lot of work with Greek and Hebrew in, in sermons. I think we can do some work, you know, um, about that ourselves, but I think some of the work that we do exegetically is like scaffolding of a house. Um, once the house is built, you don't want to see the two by fours uh, so, or the seams of a dress. Uh, we, we can know these things, we study them, but. Um, I didn't deal with that, the difference of uh, what the Greek words are for body or for flesh, but it does sound different 
when you say, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So how does that connect with Paul's amazing metaphor? And he uses the same metaphor, of course, in Romans. Uh, now, we are the body of Christ. I mean, I, I think we, we probably do Paul a disservice to say he was hard on the body, but um, sometimes it seems that he was rather negative about the body rather than positive, and he, he seemed to have some questions about his own body, you know, uh, maybe not being up to par or uh, needed to go to the fitness center or something. But um, uh, we don't know what thorn in the flesh was for him, but it, he, he seemed to have rather negative feelings about the body. So rather than look at the spirit connection between these two, between the Acts text and the Corinthians text, I wanted them to talk to each other about getting flesh on the body of Christ. Because sometimes I feel like that metaphor, body of Christ, we really want to spiritualize it. And pretty soon it floats up, way up to the ceiling, and if there was ever any body on it, it's gone by the time it gets way up there. Uh, and it becomes only a kind of idea. Well, of course, we're the body of Christ. But the minute you begin to talk about, well, who's really in the body of Christ? Are lesbian, gay, transsexual, and bisexual questioning people part of the body? Um, took a church a long time to say yes to that. Are disabled people part of the body? Uh, are African-American people part of the body. That, I think, has been a particular challenge for our church. I, I don't know why we are so white. I'm sure people have done studies on this and have theories about it. I don't know if it's because we're so Scandinavian and German. Um, I served a church in New York. The name of it was Our Savior's Atonement. It's a terrible name. <laughs> I mean, nobody could spell it. it. It has a saviors with a U, you know, O-U-R. So nobody could spell it. Few people could say it. So often they would just say O-S-A. And then it sounded a bit like the CIA or some government agency. But um, obviously a merger of two churches. And uh, Atonement was founded in 1896 on the corner of 145th and Edgecombe Road in Harlem. Thrifty Germans, they built a beautiful church there on that corner. Uh, and we actually had our 100th anniversary celebration there. There's a large marble statue of Jesus over the communion table reaching out his arms in welcome to everybody. They built that church in 1896, and they were gone by the early 1920s. Oh, what happened? The Great Migration happened. African Americans from the South moving up north, moving into Harlem, Germans and Irish moving out, moving uptown. And in their 50th anniversary booklet, once they merged with our saviors, they wrote, it became necessary for us to abandon the neighborhood where we had grown to over 1,000 souls. It's a terrible choice of words, uh, but they couldn't, they just couldn't imagine that the body of Christ could include the people that were moving in to the neighborhood. And, um, I don't know if, I mean, if that's happened over and over across the United States so that uh, we, we are indeed uh, the whitest denomination in the country. And when I thought about this sermon, I'm a lectionary preacher. I, I, I find it hard to veer outside of the lectionary just because someone says, oh, you can choose any top text. I say, well, really, the Bible is so big. I mean, it's very hard, you know, so I, uh, I actually went through a whole stack of sermons and files and thought, well, I have to analyze this sermon, so it better be something that I think I can analyze. So, uh, 
I, I landed here partly because of what I hear going on in the culture in this country. And I, I am a, I serve on a board of my college in Illinois, and um, the bishop who is, meets with our committee, um, with our board, said to me at the last meeting, he said, my pastors are utterly demoralized. They don't know what to preach. They tend to be a little more to the left politically than the people in their congregations, and they just feel like they have been silenced. Um, he wasn't really asking me what they should do. He was just really lamenting how difficult difficult it is to preach um, across these differences. So I, um, I don't know why this football thing has... I'm not a football fan so much, really. I mean, maybe when I get to the Super Bowl, I can manage to watch it, but I, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a big fan. It, it, it's just, it was just the pictures over and over again, the pictures of all those black players, and, and there were some white players too, and some white owners and coaches, but it was, the, it was just the graphic of picture after picture, team after team, and this is hard because I didn't say our president has applauded the NASCAR drivers. Now, you would probably, probably fill that in. I simply said that they had been honored and the black players had been dishonored and as not being patriotic. One rule I have about political sermons, and I agree with Caroline, uh, the gospel is very political and if we never preach a sermon that has anything to do with politics, we're gonna just have to skip most of the Bible. It was written in a very political setting. Um, but once you name a name, you've gone over the edge. Um, if I had said President Trump da, 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 said this and that, I mean, you probably know, yes, he's the one who said this. And other people said it too. Some people booed and some people clapped. But, but once you, I mean, once you go over the edge and name a president's name or a senator's name, then, um, then you, you get resistance right away. Um, I've done a lot of work about the idea of resistance. Um, the first book that I ever wrote was preaching uh, through resistance to change, transforming the stone, preaching through resistance to change double meaning there, preaching through resistance to change, I mean, because there's a lot of resistance to change, but also that you can move through resistance to change. And that people change. I've seen it happen. I've heard it. People in congregations. Um, I remember when we were going through the Reconciling in Christ program a few years ago at Our Savior's Atonement, one man said to me, you know, I just... He wasn't quite with the conversation that most of the members seemed to be on that page of, you know, voting positively to include gay and lesbian people. He said, I feel like a square peg in a round hole. But he stayed and he changed. He came to a different place and you probably know those kinds of stories too. Um, I feel now compelled to preach about racism and race much more than I ever did when I was at Our Savior's Atonement. Partly because of what has happened in the country. But I feel like in this sermon, what I wanted to say more strongly than I think I did is that this is really about incarnation. That we cannot fully see the body of Christ if the body is only white able-bodied people. If daughters are left out of the body, 
we don't see the fullness of the body. If sons are left out of the body, we do not see the fullness of the body. And I tried um, in working with this sermon, you know, I didn't, I didn't look at the first part of the Acts text. You probably noticed that. We just read it as a responsive reading, that part of Acts 2 where Peter is quoting Joel. I didn't say that. You know, Peter is quoting Joel here. We make decisions about what to say and what to leave out. That wasn't my point of doing a kind of historical study of where did Peter get this text. That would be another sermon. But I wanted us to hear that text because I wanted us to see it. Someone asked a question this morning about do you ever preach against the text. I think in some ways I was preaching maybe not against the, the Acts text, the book of Acts, but I was preaching about some missing pieces of the book of Acts. You know, if you say your sons and your daughters, and that's not, it's not one of those things where we've added brothers and sisters. The text says that. You know, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And even on my slaves, we said servants, but slaves would a, was a harder word, and I wanted us to hear that slave language. Um, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit. Um, I wanted to say, well, Peter's sermon was, didn't, didn't quite get lived out. Now, if that's preaching against the book of Acts, I mean, there are precious few women. I mean, just that one little speech from Lydia is not much. And Sapphira says something and falls dead. I mean, that's, that's, not, a, that's not a good sign. Um, so in that sense, I wanted to challenge what happens in the book of Acts. But I didn't want to say the book of Acts is garbage or the book of Acts is not true. Uh, I, I asked the question, and many times this is what I often say to students, you can ask things as questions that are very helpful. What happened to the daughters? And what happened to the slaves? That's different from saying the daughters disappeared and we don't hear from the slaves. Uh, so you, you leave some space there um, for people to think about, wow, what happened to the daughters? Now, I wa one of the things that I left out just because of time was that Mary, Jesus' mother, was there on Pentecost. I mean, you know, in chapter 1, this would have been too much to add, but that would be another, another sermon, really. Mary was there and several other women in the first chapter of Acts. Did they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in tongues? Doesn't say. But that's an intriguing kind of question to ask. Um, you know, where, what happened to those women that were there in the room? I'm always asking the question, and this I often would ask my students after they preached a sermon, what was your hope for the congregation? What was your hope for the listeners? Um, and Caroline said this too, it's not just to get information about the Bible. Uh, it, it's something else that needs to go on. Um, my hopes for you um, is that we would encourage one another to put body into the body of Christ. That we would at least be thinking more about what it means when we say we're the body of Christ. Do we help people in congregations see the body, their own bodies, and bodies of people who aren't there? Maybe there are disabled people who aren't there because there's no way to get in. So that's one thing that I was hoping for you is that we would encourage one another to put the body back into the body of Christ. And I also wanted to say, and maybe I didn't say this strongly enough, um, to acknowledge how hard this is. 
I live in luxury. I can choose where I preach or don't preach. I can say, oh, I don't want to go there. You're where you are. You know there are people in the congregation who think very differently about text, about politics, about sociology than, than you do. And so you are in a very different kind of situation, and I wanted to stand with you rather than against you. And I guess you may be in the questions, and you can say, well, I don't think that happened. Um, I mean, any time anytime we're going to talk about racism, it's very likely that people will feel guilty or angry or all of the above. Um, but I think it is just really true that if we never preach about race, we're being unfaithful. Theologically, unfaithful to the Incarnation, but also just, it's a tragic situation if we never ever preach in all white congregations about race. I grew up in a little town in Iowa. I grew up on a farm, little town, Gowry, Iowa, about 1,100 people. There wasn't a person of color at that time within many, many miles. And many of us are in those kinds of settings. Um, one of my colleagues in New York, Jackie Lewis, is at Middle Collegiate Church, which is a wildly diverse <laughs> church in many, many ways, but very, very diverse racially and uh, lots of gay people and, you know, just uh, it's a wild and wonderful congregation. Jackie talks about storying a people. She's using it as a verb, storying a people. She says that's what we do as pastors and preachers. We, we help people find a story. And over time, if we never preach on race, the story that our people take in is that, well, it's okay to be an all-white congregation. Uh, we don't have to think about it. So I tried uh, at the end to be much more specific about a racial situation, in this case, the football players. But I also wanted to name Rosa Parks as one example of a woman who put her black body on the line and refused to move it for a white man who wanted to sit in her seat. Now, most people know that story, so that was familiar. I didn't have to say a whole lot more about that. I needed to say a little bit more about disabled people chaining themselves to buses because those are heroic stories. I mean, that could be a whole sermon. But then the picture of them in the Senate Finance Committee, that crowded little room, and there they were in their electric scooters and their wheelchairs saying to the Senate Finance Committee, if you take away Medicaid, you will take away my independence. You know, I could have said more about that, but I didn't. I mean, so I hope that you got the drift of that. So, I mean, there were some specifics that I wanted to put flesh on the sermon. Um, also, I wanted, anytime we talk about difficult things, we really need to stand with the people rather than over against them. Um, to, to acknowledge our own struggles, to say how hard this is, to say we've maybe come a long way or we have a long way to go. Um, I also want to, in every sermon, honor the text as a grounding for the sermon. I didn't do as much with Acts particularly as I could have. I tried to have some fun with 1 Corinthians because I think we do this at the annual meeting. We talk about all the gifts of our congregation and you know, some teach Sunday school and sing in the choir, those kinds of things. So, and I knew, uh, I mean, I knew this was a group that would, would nod their heads and go, oh, I understand that, yeah, we've done that in our congregation. Uh, then the speaking in tongues, well, not so much really for Lutherans, but um, 
that I think in a sermon like this, there have to be playful moments. So it's not all too terribly heavy. So I tried to put some more playful moments like that in uh, toward the end that wasn't so playful. Uh, maybe it was too heavy. Um, I, um, uh, I, I, I wanted to ask Caroline this before, but um, I, I wanted to give a lot of other people a chance to ask, but sometimes I think that we no longer know what words mean, even love. Grace upon grace. Do we know what that means? How do we love one another? I mean, I, 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 don't know how to, I don't know how to talk about it except that, you know, we love ice cream. We love TV, we love a lot of things, but you're talking about something much more, much deeper than that. Um, so for us to unpack some of those words that we use, um, my spouse often says, I don't know what they mean when they say, we must die with Christ and be raised with Christ. Well, we hear that a lot. She says, I don't know what that means. Well, I guess we need a sermon on that. But um, I mean, I think sometimes those of us in the church, um, we use the same kind of language uh, over and over. And sometimes we need to unpack it or find a new way of saying it. Um, so uh, that's why I tried, to, I tried to give a picture of these two different teams, the NFL players and the NASCAR drivers. Um, and it may have sounded like I was dissing NASCAR. Um, I don't know so much about NASCAR, but you know, I tried not to diss either of those groups, but some people that are real NASCAR fans will have probably, would probably hear, well, she doesn't like NASCAR. Um, it, was the, it, it, it was the, I think when, when we, if we can give people a picture, it's helpful to them. You know, if they can picture something. Now, in some churches, you'll put a big picture on the screen. I prefer to just let people imagine what those pictures are because then they, they kind of bring themselves into that. Um, I wanted more than anything not to charge you, but to invite you. Um, and I may have failed, but you know, we can probably uh, find that out. Um, I would want us to have time for questions, and I don't know how much time we, we, we have till 4.30. Yeah. So, so um, I'm happy to, to take some questions, and um, I probably have more to say, but let me at least stop there. Thank you so much. This is uh, exactly where I am as a preacher right now. Um, I was just wondering, uh, that transforming the stone that you wrote yay so many years ago, uh, <laughs> yeah. would this be something very, very, very useful? <laughs> oh, is, of is course. Is it worth my reading? <laughs> <laughs> uh, around issues of, of how to how to preach uh, white privilege and racial injustice? Um, I would hope it would be. There are, there are some parts of it that are, that are really geared toward talking about racism, but they really, uh, there's a ch chapter on economics, there's one on sexuality. Um, it's, it's, it's very, very, some of it's very, very simplistic, or not simplistic, but simple suggestions for what what you can do. I mean, one of the main things I really think is standing with the people rather than over against them when you're talking about difficult kinds of things. But there are many different strategies. I mean, I'm not trying to sell the book, but um, 
it's, oh, yeah. as you said, you know, years ago that wrote, uh, wrote that book. When I first wrote it, people would say, when I was introduced, they would say, her latest book is transforming, the, well, there never was any other book. I mean, that was it. I mean, so that was my first book, and, um, and I have written another one since, but yes. That, I mean, I think it would be helpful. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's, it has very specific kinds of strategies that, that you could use. Yeah. Um, I appreciated how you invited us. You didn't wrap it up all neatly in a little bowl and all that. I appreciated that. Um, also, I wanted to say that um, I posted some of your words on Facebook, and I posted that you know we need to put flesh back on the body of Christ. And I just wanted to share that one of my members um, commented, "The flesh is there; it's bleeding." Well, well. Yeah, I, I, I think the other thing that we need to realize is that there are some people in our congregations who are longing for us to say something about difficult issues. Uh, because if we can't say it in church, where, where can we say it? You know, this is a... And obviously things... Uh, I mean, this is a sermon that I hope would be followed up by some kind of conversation. Um, you can't do everything in a sermon, and you, it's really more an invitation to let's talk about this some more um, and see where we go with it from here. Yeah. Yes, I loved how you talked about the story about um, Mary, the mother of Jesus, being there and how you would set that aside possibly for another sermon. Um, uh, Dr. Letson taught in our master class that sometimes during the process of sermon when you're working on your sermon, that some parts are just for you, like to take mm -hmm. away some nuggets mm -hmm. um, and some parts of the sermon for the people. And I, and I struggle with that, with like a story like that, and I think, oh, that would make such a great sermon, but like I need to get the major theme out there to the people so I can't spend time on this little nugget that I find fascinating about Mary being covered, you know, prophesying with the Holy Spirit. So do you ever go back and take those little nuggets and mm. find a way to expound upon them while still telling the, the larger meta theme you need to do? Oh, I think we, we really should do that. I mean, and, and, and the hard thing is to keep track of them. I mean, either to find a, you know, uh, I asked Tom Long once, I said, Tom, you have so many stories. Do you have a file? Oh, he said, you know, I have a shoe box. It's full of some scraps of paper. I mean, I don't know if that's really true about Tom, but, um, <laughs> You know, to, even, even on your computer file, just um, talk, you know, Acts 2. Put it under Acts 2 and then just put some things like that. Um, I mean, one question that I have about this sermon myself is, does it work to really have two texts talk to one another? I hardly ever do that. I mean, I find it difficult enough to preach the fullness of one text. I mean, you can't preach the fullness of a text, but this time I... I heard these two texts talking to one another because I wanted the image of the body of Christ and I wanted the acts. Spirit poured on on all flesh and it didn't really happen in Acts. So it didn't really happen then and it's not happening so much now. So I wanted them to talk to one another. But, you know, I have my own questions. I, I think the story about Mary being there um, in the first chapter, yeah, I would go back and read that first chapter. I mean, not the whole first chapter, but... They, they, were, they were there. Mary was there and, and, and other unnamed women. So that, did they get shut up then? I mean, what happened to them? You know, they didn't, their story just ends. I mean, they're, they're, these women who were the first resurrection preachers, gone. <laughs> they're just gone in the rest of Acts. I mean, we hear these sort of unknown women. But, yeah, I mean, I, Fred Craddock, I mean, uh, who's, you know, such a gifted was such a gifted teacher and preacher, but he often says that the things that we, we don't just leave bad ideas behind, we leave some really great ideas behind. And you need to put them in the compost pile or in a grab bag, you know, that they're gonna be made into a rug later on or something, but, but I mean, you need to, um, and I think that's true. Sometimes we find a story that's so moving and we think, oh, I've gotta use this story. Truly, it doesn't fit this text at all. So we need to f save that story, but it doesn't fit here in this sermon. And um, I think a lot of great ideas are left on the cutting room floor. 
and um, it's you know that that would have been a that's that would have been a good one. I think if I did that, I would have really had to stay with Acts, and not move into First Corinthians. Yeah, but thanks. Yeah, yeah. Barbara, one of the things you said was that you never named names. And I'm curious, do you have other ironclad rules, mm -hmm. either th other things you never do or mm -hmm. things that you always do? Mm -hmm. And if so, what are they and why? I never break confidence, even about somebody that was in a former parish. Um, because then people will say, well, she's going to talk about me when she leaves here. So, I mean, I think, uh, I think there are ways to share something that may have happened, but never, never, ever get close to sharing a confidence that, that someone has shared with you. Um, I, I think um, standing with the people rather than over against them is another, if not ironclad rule, it's something that I uh, really think is important about preaching. Uh, I think for those of us who are Lutherans, who do honor the biblical text, um, I, I think the text is our friend in particularly difficult preaching. Uh, and the, if we can stay in the text, um, rather than just, I mean, I knew somebody who was an intern out on Long Island, he said, well, our pastor, what he does is he starts with a joke, then he tells a story, then he tells another joke, and then he sits down. <laughs> no, I mean, that's maybe a blatant example, but I mean, I think it, it relates to the question that someone asked about stories, because some people can tell a lot of wonderful stories, and the text is just missing. So I, I want the text to be there. Uh, I, I think the text... Uh, for people that um, honor scripture, as I think many in our congregations do, maybe not all of them, we have very different ways of interpreting scripture, but it's our common ground. It's the place where we stand together, the Bible is. I mean, maybe it doesn't seem that way sometimes, but it really can be our friend, particularly in difficult uh, situations. So I would say stay grounded in the text, um, stand with the people rather than over against them, never break confidence, uh, use questions rather than statements uh, that, you know, that you think this is true. Not everybody may think it's true. There's a way to say that that can invite people into it rather than say, now the pastor has said it, it must be true. I think there's a way that we can engage people in a much more healthy way when we do that. There probably are others that I, that I can't think of right now, but... Um, yeah, I don't know who was first here, but. So you chose the pulpit as your main speaking point, mm -hmm. but then you were talking about the body and you mm -hmm. used your body in your sermon. So you came out when you were talking about the different segments of the congregation and what they do, and then you came up forward to describe for us the football players and the NASCAR. Mm -hmm. And you turned your body around at one point and I thought, oh my gosh, but the minute that you did that, my second thought was, okay, now I identify with her as a person, and in that moment, not necessarily as a preacher, so I could see, that's what I saw. So can you talk about yeah. your choices of moving out of the pulpit? Yeah. Um, I, I love to move around when I preach, but I also have a full manuscript. And um, I, I wouldn't say I'm glued to it, I'm dedicated to it, but I mean, I, I need it. And there were certain places that I had quotes, like the vice president of the Confederacy talking about slavery and why those monuments were put up. And um, the King quote at the end, I pretty much know. But um, I find it hard to just stay in the pulpit. Now, if you're preaching at Riverside Church and the pulpit is like way high, <laughs> You don't want to be doing this, you know, and then oh, go up there. I mean, you just, a lot of times the logistics uh, hamper it. But I would, um, one rule that I would have, I guess, is that preaching without notes is not any better than preaching with notes. Uh, I mean, now there is, in some circles, there is a kind of rule. If you don't stand in the middle of this chancel, and preach without notes, 
nobody's going to listen. Or the best way to preach is to be able to move around. One rule or other rule I have that I just thought of is make movement helpful and meaningful. Don't wander. Come to a point, say something, and then move on. But don't keep walking and talking at the same time because people, it becomes like a tennis match. Where is she going? <laughs> she's over there. No, she's over there. Um, so, I mean, I think um, purposeful movement can really help you keep track of a sermon, too. You know, that you know you want to move here, but then, but what about the daughters? And pauses are golden. I mean, uh, if you've sung the hallelujah chorus, you know how it ends, right? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And then sometimes a baby cries. But, <laughs> but really, that pause takes your breath away. And it, a pause in a sermon gives people a chance to catch up with you. And it gives you a chance if you have lost your place. <laughs> it's, really, I mean, it's very important because if you pause and you've never paused before, people will go, oh, come on. I know you can do it. Dawn, I know. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so that, I mean, that, that's not a rule so much as a, I think something that helps a sermon is to, to have a pause and purposeful movement rather than just wandering, wandering, yeah. Sorry. Uh, just first a comment, I, I share your view about the NFL, and I spell football with two A's and one L. Two A's and one L. Like the false kind. Oh. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but uh, I, some more. <laughs> On, uh, on politics, um, mm -hmm. um, I have had people object when I say things like, uh, you know, I think the commandment honor your father and mother means I should pay my social security taxes without complaining. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd vote against politicians who would want to cut it. I, I did that a few months ago and somebody said, no more politics from the pulpit. Um, and uh, when Carolyn talked about gun control this morning, oh, I, what kind of blowback would we get if we talk yeah. about gun control? Yeah. How do you address those things? Well, I, I mean, I think, I think it's very, very hard. I, I have never been a regular member of a congregation where I knew very many people who even went hunting. So that is a very different situation than being in a congregation where many people are hunters. Um, and uh, to toss, I mean, I, I'm sure that if you said that in some congregations, Caroline, you probably would, you know, get some pushback. Um, my colleague, Hal Tausig, a New Testament scholar, um, I said, Hal, what do you do about guns? He said, well, he said, I grew up with guns. And uh, he grew up in Colorado, uh, in a rural area of Colorado. He said, I had a BB gun when I was maybe eight or nine. And, um, and then one time he said, I was walking down the street, and I, I saw a robin, and I took a stone, and I threw it at the robin, and I just killed it. And he said, I haven't used my gun ever since. Now, that would not work in many situations because people go hunting for food for their families and um, I mean this person who killed 58 people had to have the kind of weapon that nobody needs to kill a deer. I mean th this, this is why I, I just don't... I would love to, to know what people do about preaching about gun control because talk about storying a people. We, we have a story now in this country 
A well-regulated militia is how the Second Amendment begins. Nothing is well-regulated. I mean, I think we could use that amendment itself to do some preaching on what does it mean? Do you need an assault rifle? You do if you want to kill 58 people from a hotel window. But you don't to kill a pheasant. My gosh, what would the pheasant look like? <laughs> I mean, really. I mean, sometimes I've wanted to be a cartoonist and have a picture of a bunch of pheasants that have been killed with assault rifles. I mean, you know, they would just be full of holes. But I mean, I, I, think, that's a, I think that is a tough question. And I, I, I would love to hear your um, ideas. I mean, and anybody's ideas. But I think that is a huge issue. And if this, this will be another one of those things that will come and go. But if we can't somehow have a well-regulated militia, I mean, we don't need a militia, but people, at least we could take the well-regulated part of it to really look at that, what kinds of regulations, if Sandy Hook didn't do it, it's hard to know what will, will ever get us to the point. I get those oh, poignant, pictures on Facebook, you know, of those children with the parents saying, you know, my son would now be 12 or, you know, whatever. It's just heartrending, but they just can't get any traction. And a lot of it has to do with making money on guns. And now people will be out buying guns after this shooting because they're afraid that there will be more well-regulated militia talk, but I'm sorry, go ahead. I, it's hardly a full answer, but I think a lot of what we can preach about is fear um, and yeah. how fear is dividing us mm -hmm. in today's world. Um, and then a question for you. I'm going to confess to everybody that a few months ago when President Trump announced the Muslim first Muslim travel van, um, I spent the entire weekend watching CNN and preached mightily about it from the pulpit on Sunday, and I lost members. Um, I've lost, and I've lost a significant amount of attendance as a result of that. And I can look back now, and as you said, naming a name is probably my biggest mistake in that sermon itself. Um, and the fact that I really looked at what I was feeling, and perhaps not what my congregation entirely was feeling. So in five minutes um, remaining, if you could tell me how to find my way back from that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I without just running in the other direction, which I'm not going yeah. to do, but it, it, I'm struggling now to figure out, especially in the city of St. Louis with all we have going on, oh how goodness. to speak to those yeah. people, um, yeah. speak to my congregation, and, and main, be able to have their ears. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it would, it would probably take more than five minutes and someone wiser than I. But, um, it, and it was hard. The, the, the ban was put in place by the president. I mean, was, was you know, so it, it wasn't like you can just say, there's a ban now. I mean, <laughs> so, I mean, I think. Um, I think it's very hard, but, and I really do think it has been very hard to preach since the election. Um, I mean, for me and maybe for you, or I mean, it may, and the temptation I think for us is to just avoid anything that even hints of politics. But um, how you find your way back. Um, I, th I think you don't, you don't preach what I would call political sermons, I mean, that are, that are primarily political. Um, like after Charlottesville. I was preaching that next day, as many of you were. I mean, er I, everything had to go out the window. Uh, I was preaching in a Deer Isle, Maine, you know, in sort of a remote area, but um, I had to change everything. I mean, Jesus walking on the water, well, does that have to do with Charlottesville? Um, I think it has to do with fear. I mean, if anyone is really looking at Jesus, can you hate people who are different from you? If you're really looking at Jesus, um, there I think we have to look at our sermons over time 
and we can't every, every Sunday preach something challenging. Um, we have to preach something that probably we would call more pastoral. Um, and, and I mean, I think we may need to just admit much more than we do, there are lots of different opinions in this congregation. We're at different places on so many things. Uh, we probably disagree on many things, and some of you disagree with me. I mean, I, th I think you can own that without saying, you know, some people have left the church. I mean, that, you don't want to say that. But I think that it is, when possible, it's helpful not to name politicians, political leaders, um, and I would say that it, was, it would be true with any political leader, even those you agree with. But um, I don't know how you find your way back. My guess is that it's pastoral. I mean, people tell the story often about Bill Coffin, who did not mince words about much of anything, uh, whether it was nuclear weapons particularly. But they asked a man in the Congre at Riverside, how can you listen to that man? You don't believe anything he says. <laughs> he says, he sat with my wife when she was dying. And I'll listen to whatever he says. I mean, I won't agree with him, but I mean, I, I think my guess is that you're a very good pastor and you're going to find ways to be pastor with people there in the congregation. No easy route though, and people will leave. I've had people walk out. But, you know, everything isn't so nice in this country or in our churches. Are we done, Carolyn? Or, oh, okay. So I, I wonder if it's enough just to say that uh, it's okay to be political but not partisan. Yeah, I but think... Even at, but yeah. even, even at that, some issues are so obviously partisan. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, the word political for some people will just, they don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that. They don't, I, I mean, so I mean, I think to use that word as little as possible, um, sometimes it might be helpful to say, what, what, is, what does polis mean? What, 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 what is political? It's how we are together, isn't it? It's not about a party. It's about the well-being of the city or the country, or the small town, the polis. It's how, that's where the word comes from. I mean, I think there's some teaching that we need to do in our, in our preaching, but um, uh, yeah, I, I, I also am trying to find a different term than white supremacy. Because the minute that you say white supremacy, there is resistance and somebody will say, let me tell you about my life. I'm not very privileged. You know, my parents died when I was five years old. Uh, I mean, or you know the stories. Uh, and, and, and so I think, I don't know what it is yet, but white supremacy, I think, puts up, I'm not saying it's not true, but I'm saying there's a way that, I, I think we need to find some language that will create less resistance while still telling the truth. Entitlement? White entitlement? Yeah, I mean, I think we need to work at that. Caroline, you are looking like we should stop. Well, no, no. <laughs> we should have a little dialogue. That would be what would be fun, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.